welcome everyone. Thanks for coming this morning. We are recording. You probably all got that message. Um, I want to welcome Cohesion Network here um, to talk with us about what they do. Um, as you probably know, lots of people here have been to several of these. Um, these nonprofit visits are our way that uh, or at least one way that we are sharing community knowledge that we have here at the Community Foundation, some of our partners and um, nonprofit organizations that we work closely with. Um, we highlight organizations that are doing good work here in the Lehigh Valley and give them a chance to tell their story to a new audience. We're going to record this meeting, as you know, and make it available to watch. Uh, just a couple things. Please feel free to put questions in the chat box at any time. There's going to be some time for discussion at the end and questions, so um, please participate in that if uh, you have things that you'd like to discuss. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Megan Briggs, who's our Director of Community Investments here at the Community wow. Foundation. Um, sometimes she's here on these chats, on these virtual visits, um, but she was a big part of getting Cohesion Network to come and do this and has a great relationship with them. So um, I'd like to have Megan um, do an introduction of our guests. So uh, go ahead, Megan. Great, thank you. Thanks, Carrie. It's really, really exciting um, to be here this morning and I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces. Um, and I'm just really, really astounded by the work of Cohesion Network. So this is like a really meaningful meeting for me personally. So I'm Megan Briggs. I'm the Director of Community Investments. And in my role, I primarily oversee foundation-directed grant making, meaning the funds that the foundation has discretion over. And so today's visit is really near and dear to my heart because we are focusing on a nonprofit and a leader that I've grown to really respect and admire, Darian Colbert from Cohesion Network. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I met Darian. And unfortunately, it was literally in the midst of a crisis. It was in the midst of COVID. So it was spring to summer of 2020. And during this time, the Community Foundation really started to connect with a lot of different uh, grassroots organizations because those organizations were on the ground and really connected with the fabric of communities and really understanding what the immediate needs were. And so we were able to work with them in order to get resources quickly into the hands of those community members that needed it at, at that time. And during that time, we were all really tired and stressed and quite literally, it feels like a fog. But what I do remember is Darian's infectious passion and how he showed up to these conversations with an open heart and his ability to really lift us all up in the midst of this stress, in the midst of tragedy and uncertainty. And in all of this, he continued to stay really humble. And since then, the Community Foundation has supported cohesion with our foundation directed funds by selecting his organization as a grantee in the highly competitive nonprofit effectiveness work that we do, which is capacity building. And we've invited him to participate as a powerful leader in project equity for which he now serves as a core team member that directs that initiative. And even though I've only known Darian for two years, in those two years, I've seen him have incredible impact on those around him, which includes myself. So that's how I met Darian. And I wanna tell you a little bit about what I've observed in those two years. So in my role, it's really important that I understand sort of the landscape of the nonprofit sector in the Lehigh Valley and the organizations and the individuals who are making a real difference in the Lehigh Valley. And in doing this, often people ask me, well, how can I tell if an organization is an effective organization? And while there's a whole checklist of things that I certainly have, 
around um, knowing what makes an effective organization, there's a couple key indicators that I really wanna pull out and focus on today. And in these key indicators, Darian and his organization absolutely embody all of them. So the first thing that I really look for is if, a if an organization is a learning organization. And what I mean by that is that um, their leader themselves is really inter interested in continually evolving as a person and as a leader. And then also if the organization itself is evolving. And these type of leaders are consistently curious and receive feedback easily in order to grow. And over the past two years, I have seen both Darian and his organization grow immensely from the way that he leads and how he's narrowed his focus and niche to the infrastructure that is now at place in the organization, which includes diversified funding streams and a more structured governance role. Secondly, I look for if an organization really understands and is grounded in the community that they serve. And on this point, Darian grew up in the first ward in Allentown and met his wife. I had to say Yolanda's name because I know that she's really instrumental in high school. He's lived here his whole life. He understands this community, its nuance, its beauty, and the struggles in a certain way that nobody from outside the community could really grasp. And this is very valuable, especially for me as a grant maker who's trying to figure out out how to make the most impact in a way that's going to be important for community. And he's willing to work with me in order to do that. Uh, so what's also really important is that the community respects his leadership, which is visibly seen through the growth and impact and size of the community block ambassador meetings that he organizes, even having the mayor attend one of the more recent meetings. And lastly, I really look for if the leadership at an organization is interested in true collaboration for the most benefit of the community. And I mean, lifting others up around them, thinking about what's best for everybody, not just what's best for the organization. And I think that this particular point on collaboration is what defines Darian's leadership. He's really great at knowing his own talents and skills and how they can best progress the common good. He truly has a sense for productive co collaboration that will lead to real change. More than that though, I have seen him have truly difficult conversations, the type that most of us want to avoid in a way that leads to relationship repair and forward momentum for all in a way that really brings us all together. And that is hard, hard work. So thank you, Darian, especially for this last part. I appreciate you so much. So the best way I can describe Darian is open-hearted, passionate, and a lifelong learner. But despite all of this, Cohesion has been a nonprofit since 2011. But I discovered that the COVID-19 Joint Fund, which was coordinated by the United Way and the Community Foundation, in 2020 was the first direct investment from any traditional funding institution that Cohesion has received despite these years of great work. Somehow, even without that institutional support, Cohesion has thrived and deepened impact. And so that's really the important part of today is really shining a light on and elevating and amplifying these organizations that haven't been widely known so it's my extreme pleasure in this conversation to connect you as LVCF fund holders to organizations that matter in our region and today that is Cohesion Network. So with that, I'll hand it over to Darian and I'm really looking forward to hearing you, my friends. Thank you, Megan. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. I think she was trying to make me cry before we got started. So I, I grounded myself and I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna cry. But thank you, Megan. Um, it's been a joy getting to know you these last two years. But I do wanna just correct my friend real quick. I met my wife in 1982 at Harrison Morton Middle School. We were in sixth grade. We were the first sixth grade class when junior high schools turned to middle schools. And I'm 
Maybe some of you remember it. So we actually met, she came from Moser, I came from Sheridan and we met there um, and we dated in seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th. And seventh grade is just simply saying, oh, that's my girlfriend, you know, and in eighth grade and ninth grade. And so I just wanted to kind of correct that because it's been a long time. So I always like to say, I've known her that long and I'm grateful that she is my life partner. And so thank you all for taking the time uh, to connect with us uh, this morning. I do want to make you aware of my board chair and my best friend, Bill Cummings is with us today as well. And before I jumped in and kind of shared who we are and what we're about, I want to give him an opportunity or a moment to say anything uh, if he desires. So Bill? Yes, I'll share more toward the end, but yeah, just honored to be here with you and just grateful that all of you have, are, are involved in philanthropy and generosity and um, just to be able to connect the dots. You know, the, the Cohesion logo is a series of lines and dots and we're all about you know, connecting dots between people and networking. And, and, and if we could, our logo would just go off the page of a website or a brochure because we love that dots connect where you lose track of them and, and how those, how they even connected in the first place. So we love opportunities like this to connect the dots between good work that's being done on the ground and great people who, uh, who are interested and passionate about supporting that kind of great work. So it's an honor to be here with you. And so I'm a big time storyteller, folks. And so just to kind of connect who we are, I'd like to tell you a true story that happened in the country of Haiti uh, back in 2010 when an earthquake happened. So I had the wonderful privilege to lead a team into the Dominican Republic and then into Haiti because the Haitian airport was closed uh, four days after the earthquake. Uh, at that time, the nonprofit I served in, uh, our executive director and our deputy director were on the grounds within 24 hours because we had an orphanage there. Uh, uh, just a couple miles from ground zero. And so I brought the Dr. Sarathia, Dr. Paul Berger, Dr. Scott Rice into, along with 15 other people into uh, the orphanage where we were. And we made this makeshift kind of like triage center. And we began serving the people right around us. Uh, what I didn't know is the day before we got there, our, our deputy director and our executive director, uh, one of the people that was with them thought they were in trouble. So they reached out to a, our state representative back home and said, we're in danger, get help. And so when we got there, we set up our makeshift triage and we began serving the people, the Marines pull up uh, and they quickly secured the site within like three seconds. And they came to me and said, where is A and B? I said, I'll, I'll get them for you. Is everything all right? I need to see A and B. So I go get A and B and I bring them to the Marine guy and he says, are you safe? They said, yes. Are you safe? Yes. And what he did blew me away. He grabs some kind of pen looking thing out of his pocket and he points it up at the sky and I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing? He goes, I'm communicating with our satellite. And I asked him, well, what are you communicating? He goes, I'm declaring this location a safe house. And I said, a safe house? Now I want you to understand the magnitude of what we're sitting in. We're at an orphanage around us, there's devastation and death. And he declared that location a safe house. So I said, help me understand why this location is a safe house. And here's the key folks. He said, because of the relationship you have with the people there. And so relationships are so powerful that they can actually make a zone like that a safe house because of relationships. So that's what cohesion at its core is all about relationship building. If I can summarize our, our mission statement, everything else, it would simply be we is greater than me. That's it. If I could summarize all that we do. And I always like to say we is hard though. <laughs> we is very, very hard. And I will tell you this, I, I say this all the time, every single person that I engage with, philanthropists, uh, 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 state reps, or people in the community, residents, I simply say to them all the time, all of us together, the school districts have a piece of the answer, which means our creative solutions only come from our togetherness. And so thank you for taking the time to listen to what we have to say. Um, we are humbled to be in this space, yet purposeful, and so with that said, um, that's kind of what I want to share. Who we are and kind of what we're about is we is greater than me. You can look at the mission statement. It says we collaborate with residents and organizations and local government to empower one another to flourish and create a, a, a lasting change. But I thought I'd tell you a story to kind of, kind of bring us all together and simply say cohesion at its core definition is the action of forming a more united whole. You can only do that through the power of we. Bill, did you want to pull up our slides or? Yeah, let's do that. Yep. Just want to make sure everyone can see that because I 
I lose you when I bring up the, the slides. Yep, we can see it though. Excellent. Thank you. And so when you look at it, and like Bill talked about, um, cohesion, um, and that's very purposeful that we have that, that, that O in there red. Uh, you can call it restorative circle. You can call it togetherness. You can call it unity. But we are all about uh, uh, sitting at a table with other people in a circle and creating conversations that will help our community. So we empowering leaders, lasting change is us. Next slide, Bill. And so I shared you with our mission. And yes, that is me at the top there. I'm at Jefferson Elementary. And I was, uh, we were doing some I am statements together. And I, uh, uh, I was getting really fired up. So uh, my wife caught me jumping in the air with that picture with Jefferson Elementary students. And this picture behind it is uh, Louis Ramos, fifth graders. Um, so that's our mission. Um, Karen, do you mind sharing what the I, some of the I am statements are? Oh, yeah. So I am statements, you know, uh, studies show that it takes seven positive words to neutralize, cancel out one negative word, whether it's a word that you yourself have spoken over yourself or someone else spoken over you. So we are big on I am statements. And a, a quick story about that is when we did this at Central Elementary, uh, we uh, first day, we always do a one I am statement on the first day and we ask young leaders, hey, uh, let's do an I am statement. And when I explained what an I am statement is. One of our young leaders ran out of the room and she started crying. And so one of our leaders went back and started speaking to the one young leader and brought her back into the classroom. And then she just said, she said she called herself all these names. And I said, no, no, we do not call ourselves negative things in this space. And I said, no, we believe. And I just gave her some I am statements. I am brilliant. I am amazing. I am enough. I am motivated. And I just gave her some, some key words. On our fifth time together with them, when we graduate them, we have them say five I am statements. And um, I always ask, who wants to volunteer to go first? And the one girl on the first day that met us who ran in the room crying, she went first and she put her hand on her hip and she said, I am beautiful, I am amazing, I am intelligent. And she just rattled off all these different I am statements. She rattled off five of them really, really fast with a big old smile on their face. That's the power of I am statements and helping young leaders to believe that, hey, that's who you are. Say it over yourself, speak it over yourself. Thank you, Bill, for sharing that and giving me an opportunity. Sure, yeah. yeah. So the problem, um, people in our local communities are disproportionately impacted by systemic injustice. They lack access and opportunity, right? That's the problem. Our creative solution is, the next slide, Bill, is to empower people socially, educationally, economically, uh, to create lasting change. And that's what, when we look at the three things that cohesion does, and we only do three things, and that's all that we do because we understand burnout is for real and you can do so many different things in the nonprofit world, but we focus on three things and that is it. Bill, could you take us to the next slide? And that is community block ambassadors, our character education and leadership development. Our community block ambassadors, we focus in on the first and sixth ward in Allentown. That is the neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, that's the kind of government name I like to say that they give the ward, um, but many people call it uh, a ghetto, a hood, an urban neighborhood. I called it home. And still, when I enter into that space, it's still home for me, even though I live on Lehigh Street in Bethlehem, that's still home for me. And I focus in on the neighborhood that I grew up in. And all we simply do is connect with residents. We, we have about 20 plus community block ambassadors represented on different blocks throughout Third Street, Ridge Avenue, Gordon Street, Turner Street. And once a month, we come together to create conversations around what does our community need? Um, the mayor shows up at all of our meetings and only has missed one in the last seven months. And then we were uh, charged with the task of trying to do the same thing in the Franklin Park community. And that is from 12th Street to 15th Street and from Gordon to Hamilton with residents. I walked that community uh, September, October, November, December, January, engaged residents. And once a month we have meetings and we're doing the same thing. We're, we, we're doing in the first and sixth ward, we're doing it there now in the Franklin Park community. And we simply ask the neighbors, what do you think your community needs? The one thing about data and, and, and boots on the ground is data told us that those two communities are entirely different. When we host meetings, we don't have to provide childcare in the first and sixth ward. When we facilitate meetings within the Franklin Park community, we realize that in
of that 539, uh, 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 of that, or 430, 437 are single mom homes. So guess what? When we do meetings in the Franklin Park community, we have to have childcare. We have to. It's super important. So that's taking data and walking the community and saying, hey, here's what we need to do for the meetings. Um, and so that's what we do in reference to community black ambassadors. <laughs> our character program is how Cohesion got started. That's how we started the whole thing. I uh, in partnership with the Allentown school district. They reached out to me and said, hey, and with that said, I researched character programs and none of them uh, that I researched, I thought would really support and help learn and grow our young leaders. And so my wife, Yolanda and I, and three other friends wrote a character program and then facilitated in the Allentown School District. And now we've had the wonderful privilege to expand to Bethlehem oh, with the full support of the board. We were unanimously voted in to provide uh, positive discipline workshops for the educators and parents and also our character program for the students. And then lastly, our leadership development is my wife, Yolanda and I are positive discipline certified. And so we, we can um, educate parents and uh, um, teachers about positive discipline. Um, and so those are the three things that we do very well. I always say we got positive discipline certified because we had, at the time, we had four kids that were young and in middle school and high school. And my wife and I did not know what we were doing. And so we went to every parent seminar they provided and we did some research and we connected with some people from Lehigh and we got connected to positive discipline. And it was really so good to us and good to our family that my wife went out and got certified and trained uh, back in uh, 2011. And we this year added that kind of to what we do in reference to programming. Um, and that's kind of all that we do, community black ambassadors, character education and leadership development through the lens of positive discipline. I know Gary, can I, I can I ask you to um, share a little bit more on the among the lines of community block ambassadors and how cohesion serves as a liaison between the city and the officials and the relationships that you have with the mayor and with you know city officials and the community and how how that being serving as a liaison helps to solve problems. I think of you know like if there's a street light out in a, in a block and a block ambassador says hey there's a street light out on our block and everyone knows that when the street light is out you know the potential for crime just significantly increases on that block so having having you know the community block ambassadors be able to tell darian and yolanda and the team of cohesion hey there's there's a problem in our community and then because of the relationships that darian has they're able to convey those you know issues or situations to you know, the, the people who are, are in charge in different departments in the city who can just escalate things and make them take care of them faster than they would if it was reliant, if the neighbors themselves or the community members themselves had to try to get that problem fixed. So I think that's a key component. I don't know if you want to say more about that. Yeah. Oh, no. So definitely. So at its core, we're bridge builders, right? And we build bridges, right? And that's what we do. And so when we look at the community black ambassador program up, story that comes to mind is um, we were facilitating meetings and our meetings are held a little bit differently. Uh, we always say this isn't a complaint session. If you have a complaint about something in your neighborhood, we ask that you bring a creative solution or you allow a conversation to help bring a solution because we will not sit here and just complain all night long. And so there was a parking situation in the first and sixth ward um, and it was alleys that literally get blocked by cars when uh, people are picking up their kids from Sheridan Elementary in the morning and in the afternoon. They literally block people in and people that work second shift jobs cannot get out of their parking spaces because the whole alley is blocked out. And so they said that's an issue. Um, Allentown Police Department, Zachary Borgi Cole, one of our Lehigh County Commissioners, Josh Siegel, one of our city councilmen, the mayor shows up. And these are some of the stakeholders, Frank Ford, who is the president of, of St. Luke's Sacred Heart. These are active stakeholders that participate in our meetings. And so Sergeant Lennon, who's the outreach coordinator for the Allentown Police Department said, hey, well, you need to get connected with the Allentown Police Department. So uh, the guy running it, Mr. Tosado, I emailed him, he emailed me back. He came to our very next community block ambassador meeting filtered questions and really was on the spotlight. And within 24 hours, he had people, because now I didn't know that they go, they have a morning shift, a mid shift and a night shift. And he had people blitz that area specifically at those times. And guess what? It eliminated the problem. Not 100%, but most of the problem got eliminated simply because we brought Mr. Desado in and explained how parking uh, how parking authority works, numbers that you can call to get access to people. All we did is connect the dots. That's all that we do. 
Um, and so that's a really good example of taking, uh, um, giving the people in the community agency and power by simply saying, here's Mr. Sasano, do you have any questions for him? And explaining their situation to him and then building a bridge right there. And they still patrol that community at those times and make sure it stays and remains uh, 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 free so people can move out of their uh, community. So thank you, Bill, for sharing that. So. Yeah, and then I know there's all different versions of this, but I'm asking you if you'd be willing to uh, like speed round, fly through the seven character points uh, in the character education curriculum and then share a story about you know, someone who's one of the students who's been impacted by that, by that program. Awesome. And so our character points, we like to say, are in order of most importance. And so our very first one is the most important one, and we work our way through till we get to our seventh character point. And so our first one is, who am I? Who am I? Some say that is the most asked question over time. Who am I? Who are you? And we focus and we begin right there with who they are. And I like to tell young leaders all the time, your superpower that you possess that no one else on the planet possesses is simply to be you. That's your superpower and all your brilliance. And we like to uh, stress them, you are enough. And those are some of the things that we do. So who am I is the first one. The next one is friends matter. I say to young leaders all the time, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Who you hang around with, who you spend time with will shape your educational experience for good or not so good. So make sure you're choosing the right friends. And we also focus on uh, choosing friends, whether you're in elementary, middle, high school, one of the most important things that you will do. And not just in those realms. We all know it's when you go to college and also in the workplace, who you choose to spend time will impact your decision-making process. Who am I? Friends matter. And the next one is you choose the power of choice. Every single week, we give our young leaders a quote to memorize. And on that specific uh, topic, it says, you're not born winners or losers. You are born choosers. The power of choice. Um, who am I? Friends matter. You choose. The next one is draw the line. And that is all about values. Stanford thought values were so important that back in 2006 and 2010, they actually did a deep, intense study. And what they did was they uh, went in and met with Latino and Black students and did a 10-minute activity on values. And then they followed them from middle school to high school. And studies and statistics show that it shaped and changed their whole educational experience for the positive. Their grades went up, their attendance went up, their behavior got better by simply honing in on what is it that they value. And so we talk about values and we do this activity. We call it step to the line. And we ask some questions about, hey, who's the oldest? Are you the oldest, youngest, or uh, 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 the only child in your family? We have them step to the line. We start off kind of really slow with stepping to the line. And then we get to questions like, have you ever been bullied? Step to the line. And I always participate in that activity to show the young leaders, it does not matter who you are. I was bullied. And I'm telling you right now, in most schools that I go to, every single student, every single time since 2011, guess what they do? They step to the line and say that they were bullied. And then we ask them more deeper questions just, just to help them understand the impact that the connection that they have with all the rest of the students, no matter what color they are, no matter where they live at, that listen what we have in common, a lot of these different things. So that's draw the line. The next one is handle your business. Self-discipline, right? When the kids hear discipline, young leaders hear discipline, they think it's bad. And I always tell them discipline means to train and to instruct. When you put self in front of it, it means to train and instruct yourself. Self-discipline. The next one is know your role. This is all about authority. We highlight educational authority, parental authority, and legal authority. And we ask them about their roles in all those areas and what are some of their responsibilities to help them connect the dots. This is my role. This is my responsibility. And we do a lot of interactive activities with them. And then also at that point, we have them write out, we give them thank you cards and we ask them, thank someone who is an authority in your life. Thank them. We just did this at Rob Middle School yesterday. And here's the power in it. The security guard, Mika there, she got a thank you card from this young leader. Another young leader said, can I walk down the hall and give this to another teacher in the building? Well, yes, you can. And the security guard walked him down to give it um, because I want them to know sometimes it's teachers that have a great impact on the students. So literally, Michael walked it down to his teacher. We got one. Um, and so that's the power in thanking adults in your life, thanking them. Because sometimes being educators, parents, and even in legal authority, guess what happens, man? It could, be, it could seem like a thankless job. And that's knowing your role. And knowing your role, we always say, when you know your role, you can own your role. And part of owning your role, you need to be grateful for those in your life that are in authority over you. And lastly, is take your place. 
And that's all about being a leader right now. We tell them you don't have to wait till you're an adult to be an elite. You can be a leader right now. And I always say, if you never figure out who you really are, you can never take your rightful place. Those are our seven character points. And only one story that I would tell you is we were graduating some students from a school and we always give them, elementary kids always get a book from us. And we gave them a book about I am worthy, I am loved, I am respected. And we read the book to them and there's an activity at the end of the book. And one of the young leaders, we had 19 students and parents were there as well because we invited parents out. And here's the dynamic, when you engage, we engage the students, but we also send parent letters home in English and Spanish, sometimes in Arabic. We send it home to the parents so they can engage your parents about all these topics. And when we did our graduation celebration, the coordinator told us you might get one or two parents to show up. But she didn't know that we were sending parent letters home every single week. And we encourage them, we give them incentives to engage their parents. That graduation class, we found out that one of the mothers was the biggest bully in middle school. And we found that all these ideas and you, they get to hear about their parents. And the one girl said, I would have never thought that about my mom because she does not like bullying. But her mom was honest and said, I was the bully in the building in middle school. And so it creates conversations with young leaders and their parents. At that graduation, one of the kids raises his hand and, and said, Mr. D, what does worthy mean? Now, my wife, Yolanda, was standing right next to me. So I was about to respond. And it's interesting. All of the parents, when the young leader asked a question, stopped what they were doing. They all looked over at us. And my wife grabs my hand and she says, hold on. She said, raise your hand if you know what worthy means. None of the young leaders raised their hand. Then she said, raise your hand if you know what worthless means. Every single young leader raised their hands. That's why I am statements. That's why character is super, super important. This, none of them knew what worthy was, but they all knew what worthless was. And that's just a story to highlight character education. And I always like to say character isn't the most glamorous thing to get funded for. It really, really isn't. But in the times and season we're living in now, I believe it is imperative that we train, empower, and educate with character education, our young leaders, um, because the reality is they are our future. Yeah, and Darren, a lot of that, you know, character education, it goes beyond what you're able to do in the time that you spend with students and needs to happen continually through parents at home and educators, you know, in the, in the, in the school system that are spending you know, hours a day, many times more hours a day than parents are. And, and I think if you're the leadership development program it, it, where you train parents and educators, you know, as it says on the screen to implement strategies that benefit adults and children. One of the things I love about the leadership development uh, program, which includes positive discipline that you, you know, teach um, and uh, teach to parents and to educators is the phrase um, connection over correction. Um, and, and many of you, if you're like me, you grew up in a generation where parents often, you know, when asked by a child, why, you know, why do I have to do that? And the parent would say, because I said so. Well, I think we live in a generation that's just not, that doesn't fly with them. You know, they, they want to know why, you know, why do, why do I have to do what you're telling me to do? Um, and, and I think of that phrase connection over correction. So Darren, could you speak real briefly to, to why connect, why you train parents and educators to connect with students before they try to correct the students? Because if they connect with them first, it gives them the, the privilege and the right first to encourage them, right? And then to hold them accountable. So once you connect with the student, all it does is open up the door for clear communication and cooperation. That's what it does. And so it is a extreme paradigm shift. And an example as well is, we always say, because I'm the parent or because I'm the teacher, you need to listen to me. Positive discipline says, because I am the educator, because I am the parent, I am going to listen to you. And so it is a, it's a, it's a shift, but what it creates is conversation. And we also, it's very, it's not, it's not permissive or punitive, not at all. It's just high kindness and high firmness. That's what it is. And so we've uh, been training in the downtown school district. We've done uh, positive discipline workshop at Brockle Middle School, at Fountain Hill, and we'll be soon doing at Nichman as well. Um, and you know what? Teachers, educators love it. Parents love it. Um, and so, yeah, Bill, that's just a, a story about our positive yeah. discipline and how it's kind of just, it's a paradigm yeah. shift. No, that's great. Um, do you, did you want to share anything else before I uh, wrap at least this part of the time up with, with how others can help? No, I just want to um, just kind of pause and stop. And I know sometimes 
I say a lot and I talk fast when I get excited. So uh, <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions before we move on to the next phase of the presentation? Because um, uh, you can drop it into the chat or just unmute yourself because I want to just pause because I know sometimes someone might have something to say before we move on. I have a, a question, if I may. Yes, Beth. Um, do you ever work with other organizations uh, serving just uh, for want of a description under privileged or at risk communities? Oh, absolutely. So uh, when COVID happened, um, I met some amazing nonprofits, but one of them, I, I Miss Mary, the caring place. Um, she was, so when the pandemic happened, remember schools got shut down in Allentown, I uh, was late to the game and getting technology to students. And also kids that don't go to school, kids don't eat. So, and, and that's huge for some kids going to school, they get their, they get meals. And so I partnered up with Miss Mary. And, and since we couldn't go into school, schools were shut down. I began delivering food across the city for specifically first six world, but then it turned out to be throughout the city in partnership with Miss Mary. And what happens is when you go down, I always like to say boots to the ground, heart to the ground. I ran into a grandmother who grew up in the first and sixth world who I knew. I knew her, her younger brother was my age and she was older. And she said, um, hey, my, my granddaughter goes to Truxa, but she does not have a laptop and she is falling way behind. Well, guess what? I'm partnering up with Miss Mary with the Caring Place. And then I am in a partnership with Unidos Foundation who was supplying laptops to uh, 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 um, students from the Allentown School District. So I made a call and 24 hours later, the very next day, Yamalisa Tavares, the founder of Unidos Foundation, dropped off a laptop, earphones, a USB, put everything the student needed to be successful. That's, that's part of the collaboration that, that we do in working with other agencies. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so we do collaborate with many other nonprofits. Um, now we're in partnership in the Franklin Park community. We're working with Community Bike Works, uh, Ripple, Inc., and many others. Casa Guadalupe is a partner uh, down in the first and sixth wards. So we absolutely work with other nonprofits uh, because we understand and know that there's an expertise that they have and we just want to partner up with them. We don't want to do what they do, but if we can build a bridge there. Yeah, thank and you. I also would... I would also add that Cohesion is one of those organizations for sure. And, and, and I think the one that's, from my perspective, one of the most well-connected organizations across, across the board. And, you know, there are a lot of, you know, and this is not the correct, the, the way the question was framed at all. Uh, yet, I think there's a lot of words that are used to describe communities, you know, uh, like, you, like you referenced. Um, one of the terms that I, I like you know, that comes from a friend of mine that works in public housing uh, in New York City. Um, he talks about the community as being underestimated, um, which I love because there's treasure in those communities that have been talked about as being under-resourced or underprivileged. And he said, no, there's great treasure there. They've just been underestimated, you know, and, and, and under-invested in. So um, that's, that's what I love about Cohesion is the first and sixth ward, Franklin Park, you know, the students that they're serving in character education, you know, are, are students that come from those communities that have been over underestimated for decades. I, I have a question, if, if you can hear me. Oh, yes, Bill, how are you? Oh, hi. Um, yes, we, we've heard from Bill and I know of Darian and Yolanda. Who besides the three of you represent the we in your organization in terms of your structure, your staff, your volunteers? Oh, well, so we have, in reference to volunteers, we have about 30 plus in the first and sixth ward uh, between residents and other community stakeholders. And at Franklin Park, we have about 15, 16. Um, and then within our organization, um, it's really my wife and I, and we have a part-time uh, a person who does social media uh, uh, for us. Um, and then we also uh, contract in one of our friends to kind of help us develop programs, help us develop the programs that we already have, help us expand them. Um, and so I would say, when we look at our partners, I would say the mayor in Allentown, I would say Leonard Lightner, the economic developer is a partner. I would say John Leonard, who's Sergeant Leonard with the Allentown Police Department is our partner. I would say the Allentown School District is our partner, but really, Parents and young leaders, they're our partners as well. The families that we yeah. have the wonderful privilege of serving. Yeah. Uh, so, and those are the people that come out to our community block ambassador meetings are parents and young leaders as well. So that's yeah, a great question, Bill. 
Yeah, I was going to say, Bill, that was an excellent question. And, and if I could add a different twist to that and just say that we've got a great board of directors, you know, I'm honored to, chair, to serve as the board chair. Um, Mark Riddle from New Bethany Ministries is uh, a part of our board and other other board members that are just, you know, committed to the cause from a leadership standpoint. Yet, to be honest, you know, and this kind of dovetails into, you know, how I was going to wrap up our time with how people can help is I've watched Darian and Yolanda do this, do the work that they do um, in the community for 25 years. It wasn't always called cohesion. It was just called Darian and Yolanda being loving neighbors who cared about, you know, the people who live next door to them and down the street from them or in their community, you know, living on Third Street in the home that Darian grew up in, you know, uh, and, and, and just being present in the community, the organization started in 2011, but it was, you know, what I'll call, you know, just, uh, um, I know this isn't, you know, correct grammar necessarily, but like a side hustle. They were, they were doing, leading the organization while working other jobs mm -hmm. and leaving their job and hustling over to, to the school to, uh, to implement the, and facilitate, I should say, the, the character education program. Uh, in 2018, um, they made a decision to, to, to work full time for the organization as a, at a time that it didn't necessarily make sense on paper financially, but they just knew in their mm -hmm. hearts that to grow it, they needed to give their full time to it. So it's only been two and a half years, maybe three years that they've been doing that and we're steadily growing and getting our footing financially. Okay. Uh, but I'm watching them lead this organization by themselves and I've, I've founded and led a nonprofit organization for 10 years. So I know nonprofits are often forced to run on lean budgets. Um, and it puts them in a position where it's tough for, you know, two people by themselves, in essence, with a little bit of help, you know, social media and different things like that uh, to support them. So we're looking to hire a director of, director of operations that can help facilitate the, the operations of the organization. So Darian and Yolanda can really spend their time not doing paperwork and not being in front of their, their, their computers, answering email and stuff all the time and invoicing schools and all that kind of stuff, but be mm -hmm. in the community, you know, up running these programs. So that's, that's a, that's a big need right now is to grow the team. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Bill, for the question. That's excellent. I have a couple, if we have some time uh, for them. Um, and, and these, these come from, uh, you know, a former, Board, school board member and former nonprofit board member for a gazillion years. Um, my three questions, and you don't have to answer them now, Darren, they might be topics for the future, uh, are you know, what, what, uh, what's your footprint? I know you're talking in the first and sixth wars and Franklin Park, and I heard a little something about some stuff in Fountain Hill. And I mean, do you, do you have a map of where you currently are and where you're intending to go? Uh, and, and maybe along with your current and projected number of uh, uh, young people and adults that you'll be impacting. Um, related to that is, uh, and this is probably too early in your uh, your uh, lifetime as, a, as an entity, but uh, are you planning to do some outcome measurements so you can assess whether or not you know, the work, the networking work that you're doing is actually having an impact on these young people as they grow older? Now, again, this is kind of early in their timeline, so you can't It'd be difficult to do it now, mm -hmm. but in your strategic mm -hmm. plan, hopefully you'll have some resources set aside to do that. Mm -hmm. And and then the last thing, and again, it's a future topic, is you know what is the agency's growth plan? You know where do you you know what is where we are today? Where do you think you might be in three to five years? And and there is probably a a boundary <laughs> around which you can't grow until it, if you grow any further, it changes the nature of the organization. So, I mean, there's probably some strategies and thought to be put together about that. But again, some topics that I kind of jot down as I saw you do and, uh, and, and think about them in the future. But I wanted to get them out there. Well, I have a response to all three questions and I'll, I'll move through it because I know we're running out of time. But our footprint, and I, I do want to be clear, we started off in the first and sixth ward and that's our target area for our organization because we understand we can't be everything to all people. Uh, but we were, were helped jumpstart a program in the Franklin Park community and we already have leaders that we're working with that live in the community, from the community, that when they're ready, they're going to literally assume, I want to say, the facilitation part of that because all it is is once a month creating conversation. So we just helped jumpstart the, the, uh, the community block and Master program and the Franklin Park community. And the goal and the hope in partnership with the mayor is to ripple it across the city 
so that we have community block ambassadors on every single block within the city. And hopefully we can be an agency that our organization that can help do that. So our footprint is to stay focused in on the first and sixth ward um, and really, really grow that community block ambassador program to show that it can have impact especially when, like Bill said, they underestimate communities like that. But when you sit in a conversation with people like that, they have some powerful, creative solutions together with other stakeholders. Outcomes and measurements. That's a wonderful question, Charles. So I've been in partnership with Moravian. Um, and so what Moravian is doing for us, their, their director of stats, is she put together pre and post surveys for young students. And so at Rob Middle School, uh, um, they take a pre and post every time we come in to take a pre and post survey and then they will take a final post survey and we'll be submitting all of those to uh, uh, Moravian College and they're going to run it through their system and give us some really, really good data. And so they're just waiting for us to do. So we have done again. We have um, Rob and we're just going to give all those pre and post surveys to her and she will run them through her system and give us some really, really good data. And as far as our growth plan, well, Bill, what's our growth plan? Because um, those two I can't answer, and I think Bill can answer the growth plan for us. Well, well to be honest, and, and, and I think that's a great question, Charles. Um, watching nonprofit organizations run so lean, it's kind of a catch-22, to be really honest, is to try to implement strategic plans and growth plans, and, and with Darren Yolanda leading the organization, being out in the community, actually showing up in the classroom, showing up at community centers to provide you know, facilitation of meetings with you know, community block ambassadors, doing the character education program, you know, doing the positive discipline, you know, leadership development program, and then be expect, you know, you know, uh, measurements and outcomes, you know, based kind of approach and to have a growth plan. So, you know, that's something we're early in our, you know, in this, in this stage, as you said, of an, as an organization. And I think, you know, having some support staffing wise will give us the capacity to have space to start thinking more strategically. Because um, I, I work with nonprofits all over the country, and that's often the challenge is such lean budgets that they aren't, aren't able to pull away from the work to work on the organization. They're constantly working in the organization. So that's definitely something we need, we need to do. And we need to move in that direction where we're more, more strategic thinking about growth and mapping, you know, it's one of the things Darian and I have talked about is adding a, you know, a map to our website that shows little pinpoints and what schools and what neighborhoods and communities that we're in and, and watching and putting a timeline to that, how it started with, you know, 11 sessions, you know, or I think it was nine, nine sessions in 2018, you know, of the character education program. And now 25, this 20, you know, 2021, 2022 school year, and already projected for 35 in, uh, in 22, 2023. Um, so growth is happening, um, yet, yet the, we're not able to be really strategic about that growth yet at this time, but that's definitely in the works with the board and you know, a more robust strategic plan, to be honest. Great questions, Charles. Thank you for asking them. And so I know- I have, a, go I okay, have a question. I have a question regarding uh, resources. Have you taken advantage of any of the resources that Penn State Cooperative Extension might have? I know they had an active program at one time in Lehigh County. I was involved in Northampton County. I was amazed at all the resources they have mm. for families and children and not just for farmers, which is what a lot of us thought the uh, Cooperative Extension was, but uh, it, it might be a resource if you haven't checked on it at this point. That's definitely something I can look into. It's Penn State. Is there any, do you know anyone I might, well, might well, can Penn reach State out to? Well, Penn State Cooperative Extension. I don't know who's in Lehigh County. I can get you that information probably I'd appreciate fairly that. easily. Okay. Um, hi, this is Andrea Tessie. I'm with Penn State Lehigh Valley and I can get you the information for uh, Denise Continenza. She does that family consumer science oh, I know program her. that you're speaking of. Yes. Yeah, so she's with Penn State Extension. She has some great resources that she could direct you to. Awesome. Yes, I know. Wow, that's awesome. And, and yeah, that, all, all the states, at, at least I lived in New Jersey and accessed their support services for cooking and, and house things that I didn't know how to do. Uh, and New York State had a cooperative extension as well. And I have a feeling it's around the country and people don't recognize that there's a resource there. Mm, Every land grant, 
university, every land grant institution is charged with an extension program. Good. Wow. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that connects back to Beal's question earlier is another member of our team that uh, that's just joined us recently, Laura, um, is a grant writer who's just able to kind of ramp up our pursuit of grants that we just didn't have the capacity to even identify, let alone, you know, write the grant application, you know, for in the in the past. So she's been doing an excellent job, you know, so this is something we'd be able to pass on to her. So thanks for that contact I'll Andrea. Give, I'll give you another resource. Uh, you might want to uh, submit a grant to one of the Rotary organizations mm -hmm. around because oh, they're yeah. looking all the time for organizations that they can support. Mm. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Charlotte. I know, Megan, we're running out of time, so I want to make sure and be mindful that I know that uh, both you and Carrie are going to close this out. But is it OK if we continue to filter questions or did you want to? Uh... Um, you know, if, if there's like one more question, we can answer that. If not, we can move forward. So is there any other questions here? We'll also, we'll also have um, we'll also send out a follow up email and you can have Darian's uh, information to, to connect with him. I see you came up Megan, mm -hmm. Megan, do we have like 30 seconds just to cover like a broader, like uh, how people can help? Yeah, of course. Yep. Of yeah. Course. So I won't show the slide, uh, but there's three, three ways invest in our capacity. You know, like I said earlier, we're looking at a director of operations, adding that person to the team. Um, so any support along those lines would be greatly appreciated. Uh, volunteering to be a guest reader in the character education program. You know, students love when guest readers come in and get to meet new people. Uh, so there's a graduation ceremony at the end of each cohort and guest readers are brought in to, to read to them because reading you know, is, is features as a high value as a part of developing character. And then in-kind donations. Uh, we're in the process of renovating Darian's childhood home that he lived in for decades on Third Street and making it cohesions um, office, uh, that it will be a place for meetings, you know, with, with, you know, city officials and, and, you know, people in the community and, and a small organic, you know, relational co-working space as well for people in the community who want to come, you know, do a tour and walk around the community with Darian to get to know, you know, the city, that part of the city better or parts of the city that they wouldn't necessarily go through, you know, on their own. So those are three different ways, invest in our capacity, volunteer, and maybe in-kind donations to help support the, you know, the furnishing of the house that's being renovated that will be the cohesion office. Great, thank you. I wanna just um, say before Megan takes over, thank you all for really taking time to connect with Bill and I in the really uh, work we have the wonderful privilege to do uh, in the Lehigh Valley. So I do wanna thank you all for taking time on your very busy schedule to connect with us like this. And I'll turn it over to Megan and Carrie and Monique. Yes, thank you. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, I wanted to just summarize some of the main points that I got out of the last hour um, as a way to kind of wrap us up. So one is everything I said at the beginning is true <laughs> about Darian. He is incredibly passionate um, he's incredibly collaborative. He shows up with an open heart and he brings us all together. Um, the things that I really got out of your, your um, presentation, Darian and Bill, is that one, the power of relationships and how, they, how important they are. And I think that really lines up with the Community Foundation's shift towards really um, investing in relationships for transformational change. And I think the relationship that we've been able to have, Darian, has produced some transformational um, things. So absolutely. Two is that cohesion is really a center for systems change in that you are able to connect community voices with systems and systems, individuals that are in those systems to make real change that makes a difference in community. 
And that also the way that you engage young people empowers them and that you yourself really embody a lot of the characteristics that you are, um, you know, that you're working with in young people. Lastly, is that you are a growing organization. You have been underinvested in and you have still been able to do all these amazing things despite being underinvested in because of who you are. And so I just want you to know, I appreciate you coming here. Every time you speak, I learn something and I appreciate your partnership. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your kind and generous words and your friendship. So it's about time. Um, this has been a really beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Darian and Bill for joining us. Um, for those of you who aren't staff of the Lehigh Valley Community Foundation or and just joining us to learn, um, Darian and Bill have asked if it's okay, speaking of relationships, to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, so if you are uncomfortable with that, put it in the chat to me or send me an email. Otherwise, I'd like to share your email addresses with Darian and Bill so that they can um, come up with some of those connections on LinkedIn. I also encourage everyone to find them on Facebook and their other social media, uh, check out their website and sign up for their newsletter, which I'll put links to all of these things in a follow-up email to everyone so that you can do that. Connection is everything in this case. Um, you're also welcome to support them and we encourage that as well. Um, they take donations um, and you're welcome to use your donor advised fund at the foundation to support them as well. So we can talk about that if you're interested. With that, I think that we can wrap this up. So thank you again so much, Darian and Bill. Um, if you guys wanna stay on for a few minutes, we'll yes. chat a little bit. Otherwise, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon um, and we can connect at another time. Thanks so much, everyone. It's nice to be with you. Nice to meet all of you. Wonderful you. presentation. Good to see you. Thank you, Monique. Good to see you as well.